I went to study the drum dance. That was my that was my uh, stated purpose for going. I really didn't know how I was going to pursue this. Um, I think in my mind's eye, the only sure way to do this kind of research would have been to find musicians in about seven communities and interview them. I didn't think about that as a strategy when I went there. It's just that it would have it would have come to me. The problem is that then then from that point of view, the problem is that in the area where I where Margaret and I lived, the communities are separated by two hundred kilometers at least from each other. Um, so these are major journeys. And I found out right away that people don't, no one really claims, at least not to me, that they're a musician. That that is not a, oh, I play the drum, or, you know, but I'm a hunter. I'm this. Um, so it was kind of strange stymied about what plus the, in your mind's eye you think well I'll be able to go and ask people about you know lullabies and you know different kinds of music but I really didn't I found that that it didn't occur in any kind of a natural asking a question like that probably would have never come up in natural discourse. I would have to be acting like an anthropologist pursuing a topic. And somehow that did not make good sense to me. But I still needed to do something on music. So I told people that I was interested in that. Ma'am, I think it was October 4th. So it's this is now October 1st of 2016. So this was October 4th of 1969. These kids come running around to my house saying, we're going to have a drum dance tonight. So I said, great. And I got my gear and went and we had a drum dance. It lasted about five hours. I recorded the whole thing. I took some photographs of what was going on. I danced, Margaret and I danced, and I came home. So now I had some stuff, but I wasn't exactly sure what to do with this stuff. Um, and I don't think I did anything with it because actually the, the stuff I was talking about with Jesse on the kinship and all, that was way more interesting. And I don't think I ever had a conversation with anyone, except I asked somebody at one time, were they saying any words in the songs? Or what were the names of the songs? And I did that. So then there was another drum dance at Christmas and another drum dance at Easter. And that may have been all of them. So then I had to figure out, well, what am I going to do with this? And I decided I, there were two kinds of drum dances and what was the difference between them and then what kind of melodic lines existed. I did an entire technical analysis of it and that turned out to be my PhD dissertation. I think the contribution that I made was that you could find that there were ways in which songs, there were rules for composing songs even though there were no composers. So that different styles of songs had typically similar kinds of, of structures 
embedded in them. I also proved some, uh, you would say, one would say trivial points, but points that I found it hard that no one had ever actually proved, which is that if two people sing the same sing the same notes in two different keys, are they actually singing the same song? So I showed, so I started with that and then I did, this is the, these are the notes that are used, these are the rhythms that are used and so on. So very technical. Then after that I wrote a paper called, I think, Social Context and Music Analysis of the Dene, something like that. And in that one, I started to realize that what was important about the drum dance to me as more of a social anthropologist than a linguistic type was the function of the dance in terms of creating social solidarity. And so I wrote about that and the stresses that were going on in the community and how working together to produce a successful drum dance created, uh, promoted the notion that we were a community that was able to withstand the pressures that were going on around us. So I, I, wrote, I wrote that. I don't think I ever published that. I did publish the one paper, but I don't think I ever published that. That's, that's probably the, the best one I did. It's, there's a bit of it at the end of, of the book, Kinship and the Drum Dance, and, but yeah, that's, that's that. But my real li lifelong ongoing research interest, other than the business with the economy, which I wrote a lot about, um, has been about Dene kinship. And I am, I'm particularly, I want to be particularly encouraging to students and other anthropologists to not abandon thinking about kinship. I know that we don't do it very well, but here's the thing. You go out on the street and you talk to a hundred people and a hundred people will tell you all kinship systems are the same. We have a mother, father, an aunt, an uncle, and we have cousins, and that's the way it is. They don't have a clue that people organize themselves differently. So maybe that's, it's important that they understand that. So for that reason alone. But then here's another thing. In the, when we started to talk about kinship in modernity, which I think is in the 17th century, maybe early 18th century, when important people like Thomas Jefferson or, um, anyway, uh, were wanting to deal with the development of language from a philological scientific point of view, sent out word lists around the world to find out what were the original languages and so on. The surprise that they got was that everyone didn't call kins people by the same terms. Now, mostly when Western mind hits that kind of stuff. They think the other people are irrational and stupid and it's not worthwhile pursuing. And certainly there's a lot in anthropological kinship earlier on, especially that basic, that says that. But there's always been a strain that said, no, no, these are logical systems of some kind. We just can't figure it out. And good on us because we're so arrogant generally that we don't think there's anything to figure out if we don't understand it. So kinship has been really an important contribution for anthropology because it has 
challenged us to rethink some very basic categories of the way in which we think the world works. Okay. We don't get it. We don't get it well. Honest to God, we do not get it well. We do not understand it well. And we make all kinds of mistakes. But I can tell you that it is central to the way in which the people that I've worked with organize their politics, organize their lives. And if you don't get that, you probably are going to miss an awful lot of what's going on. And that doesn't mean that it's easy. So, here's this thing. There's about, I don't know, someone wrote there's five different kinds of kinship systems. I don't know how many there are, but let's say, well, it doesn't matter, but let's say there are a, sh a small number of kinship systems in the world, which is interesting because it doesn't overlap with how many cultures there are. Different cultures have similar kinds of kinships. That should be interesting in itself. So what is the effect of having a particular kind of kinship system? What does it do? What's the work that it does? Well, again, my hero in all of this stuff, Levi Strauss, had some really good ideas on this in the elementary structures of kinship. So I'm getting closer to where I want to be, but it's still a bit, bit of a way. Um, he said, if you line things up logically, you can say that there are three basic ways in which kinship is organized in the world. The first kind is called elementary structures. And it's like I'm giving a lecture on an elementary structure. But anyway, the first kind is elementary structures. Um, and here, you know the category of the person you're going to marry, as well as the category of the person you're not going to marry. And then he explains how this plays out in all different kinds of ways. Then he says there's a second kind, which he calls Crow Oma, which tells you who you can't marry and gives you a limited number of possibilities for who you can marry. And that's clan organization societies. And then there's what he calls complex. Now, in this Future Kinship Studies article, he does this beautiful thing of explaining. So I'm just going to do this one, and then I'll go right on to the Denny. He does this beautiful thing in which he explains the rise of Crow Omaha systems. So, and here's what he does. He says, okay, the elementary structures of kinship, they are good when you have a small population and you're reproducing that population it, because it produces your marriage partners from the people you're already related to. But what happens when it comes to agriculture? He says, well, most people think that either the population went up greatly and so we had to invent agriculture or we invented the tools for agriculture and so the population went up. He says, nonsense. Unless you can figure out a social organization that will enable you to accommodate larger number of people, you can't get the energy to create a society that would sustain the Neolithic Revolution. And he says that was the invention of the Crow Omaha system. By switching certain things around, they then enabled larger and larger groups to become incorporated within a particular polity because you didn't have to marry back all the time. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant idea. Lost, 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 completely lost. I'm not saying it's right. It's a brilliant idea, lost. Well, so now we get to the Denny. So when I went there, armed with what 
what I understood from elementary structures of kinship, which is that the simplest form to understand is unilineal descent. I'm sorry for the vast general public, but I have to do it this way. Otherwise, I'll be here for two weeks. Unilineal descent, on the one hand, and cross-cousin marriage on the other. Those are, that's the basic form. Produces a moiety kind of situation where one side marries the other side in perpetuity. Okay. Interesting idea. Okay. So, I go there, that's the only thing I know, for sure. And I run into Jesse Hardesty. The Dene, ow, should, okay. I run into Jesse Hardesty, and this is all I know about the Dene, coming from these American anthropologists who don't have any knowledge of what um, Levi Strauss is talking about. They're saying, well, they've got an interesting, the Dene have a really interesting kinship system. They have cross-cousin marriage, maybe, because they have, they differentiate between their parallel and their cross-cousins, so that might be, and they, and the first, well, no, how should I do this? I'll do this another way, sorry. They might have cross-cousin marriage because they differentiate between their father's brothers and their mother's brothers. Okay. But when you get to the generation of ego, they call all of their cousins brothers and sisters, violating that rule of reciprocity, right? And then they go about trying to explain it, and they can't. Uh, so June Helm comes the closest to her, her explanation is, well, they used to have cross-cousin marriage, but the priests got to them, and so they're now suppressing it. But that couldn't be because the for earliest kinship terms that were found, they were doing the same thing. So I don't know what the answer is, okay? So I have that on the one hand, and I have this thing about from Levi Strauss on the other. Those are, those are the two things, and I go and I talk to Jesse. Now, the Dene don't have unilateral descent, different from what? Levi Strauss is talking about. But they do have cross-cousin marriage. Okay, so I can talk to her about cross-cousin marriage through that lens. Here's what I find out. And this is, mind you, it's a hypothesis, but here's what I find out. In the Dene way of looking at things, so we're differentiating between cross and parallel cousins. That's why I'm calling it Dravidian. Anyway, the differentiating between cross and parallel cousins. But they have a an understanding that you shouldn't marry, don't even know the descent, you shouldn't marry someone in the community you grew up with different from unilineal descent. So how do you express that? By calling them brothers and sisters, because you can't marry them. So they have a general understanding that they do marriages in this way, and they have a very specific kind of rule to make sure that they don't marry wrongly by marrying too close, as they would say. Now, why is that important? Because all the politics that goes on among the Dene when I was there is based on how you stand in this dimension of cross or parallel with the person with whom you are engaged. And the whole the politics is to attempt to make everyone your brother or your sister, so that you're on the same side, except at the moment of marriage, when you can be my in-law because I'm going to marry you. So it's really central to how they're imagining what's going on in their political lives, how, they, how they're playing it out. 
and also politically relations with other people, relations with animals. It all comes through the idea of marriage bringing together two to become one, but then they're, they're networks, they're all networks. We can't even begin to express that without understanding what's going on with their, with their kinship system. And so I'm really disappointed that we don't teach it anymore. And there's a really good book that's just been written by a guy and uh, who worked uh, reserves in Saskatchewan. And he's, he's struggling because he hasn't learned this, he hasn't learned this aspect of kinship terminology. And so he can't figure out how people who are second cousins and third cousins could actually form groups as though they're one family. Whereas in the way in which we understand through this way of looking at kinship, it's quite easy to do because they are all on the same side. They're all on the same team. Anyway, poorly explained or not, that's the stuff on kinship. <laughs>